have Ms. Glasser to thank. Uh, Susan Glasser is, of course, editor of Politico, but she was also the founding editor of Politico magazine, uh, the award-winning publication featuring both long-form reporting and opinion journalism. Some of the site's most influential and highly read articles have come from this very magazine. Yet, Ms. Glasser's illustrious journalism career started far before her involvement with Politico. She began her career as an intern with Roll Call, which is a newspaper covering the U.S. Congress. There, she rose as an intern to become editor of Roll Call, uh, which is obviously a very impressive feat. In fact, Susan Glasser only joined Politico after several years as editor-in-chief of the award-winning magazine Foreign Policy, overseeing its relaunch in print and as a daily online magazine as well. Uh, in addition, her career has led to the involvement in some of politics' most exciting moments in the last decades. Uh, Glasser worked for a decade at the Washington Post, where she was a foreign correspondent, editor, and political reporter. During her time at the Post, she was Moscow's bureau chief, uh, along with her husband, and they co-authored a book on Vladimir Putin's first term, which remains, of course, today as relevant as ever before. Uh, she also covered the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq as a correspondent for the Post, including the Battle of Tora Bora and the invasion of southern Iraq. The only blemish on her otherwise exemplary record is that she is a Harvard graduate, but I think we can forgive her for that today. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, the politics editor-in-chief, Zach Cohen, Chairwoman Anna Barrows, and of course, Susan Glasser to the stage in front of us. Um, hi everyone, thanks for being here today. I'll just say a few quick words about myself. Uh, my name is Zachary Cohen, I'm a junior from New York City, and I'm studying history and political science. I'm one of the co-editors Um, and my name is Anna Barros. I'm also a junior, a political science major, and education studies scholar. I'm the chairwoman of The Politic. Um, and we're very happy to have all of you here. So we'll get started with our first question. We will do a question and answer for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. So um, fill out your note cards and we'll take them up. So our first question is, there are many aspiring journalists in the audience, some of them have always wanted to go into journalism, and some of them have just recently figured that out. Um, your parents, Lynn and Stephen, founded the Legal Times newspaper that covered law and not meaning in Washington, and together they published what seems like hundreds of books in uh, law and business, and so we were wondering what drew you to this career path, how did you, how did you know you wanted to be a journalist, how did your parents' career affect your decision to enter journalism? Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you. And thank you for that incredibly nice introduction. Uh, I did go to Harvard because my brother went to Yale. Uh, and he was, he was the editor of the Daily News. Uh, and so that, in answer to your first question, I would say it's true that we were lucky. Uh, you know, in many ways, uh, I do think that uh, my dad's love of newspapers, and that's really what he wanted to be. Uh, you know, he, he ended up going to law school uh, at the insistence of his father. You know, I wouldn't None of you should do that unless you want to go to law school. <laughs> uh, but I think he always really wanted to be a reporter for my father. And so, yeah, certainly both my brother and I, um, uh, out of our four siblings, two of the four basically became journalists, which is probably unusual. Um, uh, he did end up going to law school, by the way, uh, my brother. But he then went back and now is a lawyer for the Los Angeles Times. So, you know, you can have a, uh, an intersection of things you want. And I, you know, the only thing that I would say to all of you guys as you're thinking about, well, what, you know, what kind of career path should I take is that uh, with the incredible sort of dazzling transformation uh, and really sort of uh, flowering of a lot of innovation in media and journalism over the last couple of decades with the change in technology, you're much more able now than ever before to chart a course that's much more sort of custom made to your own interests and skills, and that is a great blessing. You know, it can be a lot more uncertain, and it is, there's no question, it's a much more uncertain time, because in the old days, you know, when I was in college and leaving college, it was really a much more straightforward sort of pipeline. Uh, and that meant that there was an established route, but also, uh, you know, that it was, there was a scarcity. Now, in many ways, you're only limited by your own imagination, right, uh, in figuring out or starting your own uh, new magazine or website or uh, that sort of thing. But the flip side is uh, the life cycle of all of these projects has really accelerated. And so, you know, you have to have a pretty high tolerance for uh, risk or un 
uncertainty. Um, but I would say journalism is not dead, uh, and I've always been a big uh, techno-optimist. The truth is that uh, there are winners as well as losers in any kind of disruption, and uh, if you think that's what you want to do with your life, like, you should jump in and you'll have lots of cool stuff to do that we couldn't have even dreamed of when I was in college. So. Yeah, well, you preempted one of our later questions about journalism, um, but I kind of want to take what you're saying about innovation and pivot towards Politico. Um, so in a time when there's so many different news outlets and you know headlines are everywhere you see, um, how does Politico continue to innovate? Um, how does it stand out um, to its readers? You know, How does it kind of keep a reader base in the middle of so many different options? Uh, it is a great question because I feel like the word to me of this election cycle when it comes to the media and politics really is fragmentation. Uh, that is, it's been happening for a long time, uh, but it's really accelerated now. And you know, this rapid prol proliferation of new platforms, not just technology, but actually new platforms and uh, new news organizations means it's harder and harder to convene anybody uh, and to control kind of the agenda yourself, right? And so that's certainly true. Uh, Politico was founded just about 10 years ago in the run-up to the 2008 campaign. Uh, when I joined it about three and a half years ago to start Politico Magazine, uh, you know, sort of coming out after the 2012 election, I'm not really sure sort of well, where to go next with it. Uh, and I'm very excited about what I feel like we've added to the place over the last three and a half years because basically our theory of the case was uh, let's find a way to double down and emphasize that which only Politico can do. That in, at a moment of fragmentation, and people talk a lot about kind of the commodification of the news, this idea that basically, you know, any sort of breaking news ticker, you know, is just going to be uh, out there. It's become like wallpaper, you know, in our universe. I mean, the other day I got in the elevator in our building, right, and, you know, it was like, you know, headline, Donald Trump in debate says this, right, and so that's the commodification of even political news. And so I felt like, well, in a way, that is a good news story for anybody who really aspires to create great original journalism because that's kind of the only strategy I know for how do you uh, keep going uh, and doing uh, original work uh, that uh, the computer algorithm can't do uh, and uh, that really relies on either creating expertise or you know finding a way to take readers inside the rooms that we're not invited into as opposed to the things that are increasingly manufactured for our behalf or that you know politicians now uh, they have the same tools that I have, right? They can speak directly to an audience. They want to put their manifesto on medium.com. You know, they can do that. You know, look at the <coughs> Trump's use of Twitter, uh, right? You know, you, 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 they're cutting out the middleman. So we journalists uh, have to find other ways, which to me involve actually things that are really important to our core values as journalists. So, so you mentioned this fragmentation that's going on in the media markets, and so. Um, talk a little bit about Politico's audience. And so the name Politico refers to those most influential people in the country and it seems like that's who Politico is trying to target. And so given that um, one in every six or five political readers live in Washington, D.C., presumably a large portion of those work on the Hill, um, so who is Politico's intended audience? And so how, would, how did Politico strike a balance between publishing articles catered to those elite readers and readers in the rest of the country? Well, that is a really good question. I think that you know any media person that you're talking to now, uh, asking them about their audience and what, you know, what they're trying to do is really an important question because frankly, when I graduated from college, when people you know, were, were still in the age of the mass media, that was one of the big problems of places like the New York Times or the Washington Post or, you know, like like the Washington Post when I started to work there. Uh, it was sort of a pleasing anachronism in many ways. Uh, but, you know, Don Graham, who owns the Post at that time, he really loved the idea. And there was something very valuable about this notion that it was a public space, right? That it was for the bus driver in Prince George's County and for the politician on Capitol Hill. You know, for the person uh, inside the White House uh, and also for the 
school teacher in Montgomery County. Um, in reality, those audiences really probably didn't overlap all that much. You know, maybe they still like all cared about the Redskins scores or something like that. But um, you know, we just didn't really have the metrics or the information or the understanding to you know to understand that they were using it and thinking of it in a very different way. It was like you know, it was like a shopping mall, you know, kind of approach. Uh, and now, of course, you know, we live in the, the golden age of boutiques, you know. Uh, so Politico is a boutique. Uh, that being said, we're right in the height of a national uh, election year, and so uh, there are millions of, of readers uh, who are interested in the kind of, uh, you know, aggressive and original and authoritative reporting about politics and policy that we're doing. So al along with everybody else, we've seen a dramatic increase in, in our audience. Uh, over the last couple of years of um, Donald Trump's ascendance and all sorts of other things. So, you know, we're right now, like, I think last month we had more than 30 million unique visitors, which is a ton. We were pretty much uh, around having 10 million unique visitors, uh, you know, sort of a couple of years ago. And that is a, a pretty huge change in a short amount of time. Uh, and I would attribute it certainly to the overall just interest in all around the country in the election, but also to the fact that if you look, it is also kind of strategic. It's because we've been doing more things uh, that really are our own original reporting around the campaign and less sort of just here's what happened today. Like we're really aiming every morning when you wake up, the stories that we're picking every day at 4 o'clock are what are the best four things that we have that nobody else has. Uh, and if you look, those are actually the things that get the largest audience to, so that there's a really good overlap between uh, our strategy, right? And that's actually what people want. So that, you know, there's a, a good journalism premium in a way. But what's our business built on? It's not just eyeballs. If that were the case, right, you'd be in a losing uh, battle, right? There's always a bigger website, there's always more eyeballs. Uh, you know, if you really want to have a lot of readers, you know, have cat videos or, you know, porn, I mean, you know. Uh, and so uh, we're lucky, I think, not to have a business model that is tethered to sheer number of eyeballs. Um, and that's, I think, really an important thing to say. Yeah, that's great. So um, related to what you were saying about picking stories, right? I think a really, <clears throat> sorry, allergies. Um, I think a really big part of, conversations about journalism, especially in this new cycle, is how do you keep bias out of mm -hmm. um, stories, how do you keep sensationalism in a lot of ways, how do the, you know, um, Trump's rise has given us new ways to talk about or question those things of ourselves. Um, so when you are, you know, helping to pick a story as, as the editor, um, how do you make sure that you're curbing those kinds of things, bias, sensationalism, um, and then as a follow-up, how have you dealt with the Trump problem um, related to that? Well, you know, I, I guess I'm going to be sort of challenge the conventional wisdom a little bit. I think, in a way, Trump has been oddly liberating, at least from the question of sort of bias and the media. And here's why. Uh, you know, if there's one core principle, you know, that cuts across, uh, you know, most of what we as journalists do, right? It's it's the holding the value of the truth and facts and insisting upon the role of facts, uh, regardless of your interpretation, regardless of your political spin. And, you know, what's been, on one hand, most disheartening uh, is not only do you have one candidate who really is a serial liar beyond, which we've, we've really never seen, uh, you know, in sort of the modern era in American politics, but, you also have, I think, this new sort of media ecosystem where people are surrounded kind of in this haze of kind of like-minded spin. And uh, that's been going on for a while. What seems new or newer now is the idea that people now seem to feel entitled to their own set of facts and not just their own set of, um, you know, interpretation of the facts. So in a way, that's liberating, right? Like, you know, there's no real ethical quandary as a journalist when we say, gee, we're going to spend the week fact-checking Donald Trump's speeches. And we did that once in the primary season. We, we recorded every single like public statement he made in the course of the week and his speeches and the tweets. And we found that he basically had a lie or an exaggeration.
misinformation or a mistruth once every five minutes. Then we repeated the exercise this fall in the general election, uh, and after we've been criticized a lot for uh, lying. And we found actually it was now down to once every three minutes. Uh, so <laughs> clearly he wasn't paying that much attention to the criticism. But, you know, ask a journalist, they, they don't feel very conflicted. Like, should we call a spade a spade? You know, Dean Becky, the editor of the New York Times, has talked about, uh, you know, yes, I'm going to use the New York Times as bully pulpit to call out a lie and I'm not going to shade that. Um, I think it's a lot more complicated and, and, and painful of a conversation uh, outside of this year's presidential campaign. Yes, we can, we can consider this election, we can consider 2008, 2012. So just to give people a little bit of context, last month we hosted John Davidson, the host of Faith Nation. Uh, many of you guys were there. I thank you for coming in. He moderated the second Democratic primary at Faith. And so we had asked him last month what he thought the role of the moderator should be. And so to sort of take a similar question, uh, you touched upon this briefly, but what should the role of the journalist be in this election? So when I think to sort of take a step back from Donald Trump in 2016, should Politico have a responsibility to present candidates as even-handedly as they can, or rather should they push their readers to support one or the other? Well, again, I feel like we're particularly lucky relative to sort of some of the more, you know, like a platform like the New York Times or the Washington Post in the sense that we are, as you said, you know, aimed at sort of not purely insiders, but people who you know really care or need for their business in some way or their professional life to uh, understand uh, what's really going on inside the American political system, whether it's this year in a campaign or next year in the context of a new White House and how it interacts with Congress and how it makes policy. You know, we're aiming towards a different kind of audience. We have a different mission. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, we don't have an editorial board, we're not an, uh, endorsing candidates. And I think, to me, that was always one of the great benefits of Politico since it was founding, is that it had uh, sort of deliberately, at a time of increasing partisanship as a media, it had gone the route of saying, uh, no, we want to be uh, a neutral meeting ground where, uh, and I, I would argue that in this day and age, Politico is one of the only major news outlets uh, where people from both parties are forced to reckon with it, you know, and also where they are getting the same set of information uh, at the same time. Uh, and right now, it, although the sort of trend has been in the other direction, I would say sort of paradoxically that's made it more valuable turf, you know, it's much more valuable turf. If you uh, are, like, say, a business person who needs to really understand, well, what's happening on a healthcare fight, you know, in Capitol Hill, you know, you might have your personal preferences. You might have a team that you're cheering for uh, in the election, but you don't want any, you know, sort of BS when it comes to, you know, telling the people in your business, like, what, what what's really going to happen. Uh, and so I think it's a very valuable thing, uh, as well as being very good for journalism, uh, you know, that we're set up to be independent and really not person. So to follow up on that, Politico doesn't have an editorial board, but so do you think that this election changed the rules of the game for Politico and other capital Hill publications that are structured like Politico? Um, did this did the, did the, did the rules change to sort of sort of force Politico to sort of take sides rather than to challenge your neutrality as a publication at all? You know, it never I have not uh, thought at any time, you know, or argued for like, well gee, we should endorse uh, Clinton in the way that some publications are doing or something like that. Um, I still believe that that's a, it's, it's a core principle for us. Um, I also think that, uh, in a way, again, Trump is so sort of sui generis, you know, that he basically, uh, you know, has made it easy. While it's true that there's been very aggressive, tough coverage by Politico and other news outlets of Trump, uh, it's not ideological if you look at it, right? You know, it's not, uh, you know, it's very specific to, well, here's a person who's lying, or here's, you know, facts of his biography that he hasn't laid out, or here's the sort of dysfunction in his campaign that, that we're writing about. And so, you know, it's not, at least the way I view it, it's not partisan, and I think we would try to be as vigilant as we 
ever have in previous collections to make sure that our uh, reporters were not uh, taking sides or sort of joining uh, an ideological point of view. But that's not the same thing as pulling back from having tough coverage uh, of one person just because he is representing a particular party. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, as you were saying earlier, we are two weeks away from the end of this very long <laughs> Uh, and yes, uh, terrible process. Um, so, well, again, my own bias in that. Um, so, I guess now looking forward, uh, you will no longer be with Politico past the election, but um, how do you foresee Politico kind of holding on to its new readers? Um, how does it make its success from the last year sustainable outside of election season? Um, and kind of in that vein, you know. as well as being in charge of editorial innovation for the company. So okay, yeah, actually, I it's, one yeah. of my big, it's one of my big mandates to try mm -hmm. to you know, think about, well, what, you know, how do we all go forward? It's one thing to get people interested in a once-in-a-lifetime election of Donald Trump, right? <laughs> uh, you know, it may be harder, and that's where I, I think I was making the point that if you are just looking for overall number of readers or eyeballs, um, that's not a good model for Politico or any of those sites really and especially because it pulls you away from the kind of expertise and authoritativeness uh, that I think you know we really want to have and that I think creates the most value for, for readers it goes back to this question of who's your audience uh, well so for example about half of I have a newsroom of about 200 people right now uh, about half of them are in our kind of subscription policy vertical so if you uh, are you know need to know about healthcare policy or energy or uh, the environment or um, uh, labor policy, things like that. Uh, these are subscription kind of news services within our broader newsroom. And then about half are in more traditional uh, uh, roles of covering the White House and Congress and campaigns. And, you know, in many ways, right, that's the business of Washington is actually uh, a better business to be in anyways for a news organization. So uh, it certainly affects a place like Politico a lot less than, say, you know, CNN, which has spent literally like something like $50 million or something unbelievable. It might even be more uh, building up a whole uh, infrastructure of uh, political coverage. You know, it, it, if Donald Trump doesn't win or, or there isn't some ongoing national crisis, it's hard for me to imagine what's the ongoing business model associated with all those people uh, and that not only the website as well as on TV. I mean, you know, we'll see what happens, but I would be very skeptical that CNN would still be paying all those millions of dollars, um, you know, two years from now for uh, that kind of a political campaign. Mm -hmm. So, get you to the, to the business side of Politico a bit, you talked about how the, the newspaper industry is a in Washington are sort of immune from a lot of the challenges going on in the rest of the country. Um, we've seen newspapers taking a bit on South America. Uh, writers are taking layoffs, uh, print taking a backseat to the internet, but Politico seems immune from all of that in part because many large companies that have a stake in lobbying Congress create this advertising market for Politico. Um, and so, what I'm wondering is, does Politico share the same fears as, say, the Washington Times, Washington Post, <coughs> and the New York Times? Or if not, what are Politico's long-term concerns? Well, I mean, look, I think it's such a disrupting uh, uh, time in any part of media that you're in. Uh, you know, if you're not continuing to change and adapt and grow, you, you can't just stay still and be like, oh, we've got it figured out. <laughs> uh, you know, because then somebody will come along and change it. Which is why, again, I think having a strategy that's rooted in journalism and, you know, sort of original value that we can create still makes a lot of sense to me because certainly if you're too platform specific, uh, that's the part that I really feel like the pace of disruption is just increasing, right? You know, 
you have to be pretty platform agnostic, right? You know, because um, you might find yourself needing to compete two years from now uh, on uh, a platform or in a medium that doesn't even exist now. Uh, and so making it about the content and the substance, I thought was always like the great insight of Politico since it was founded. And I think that, you know, being about subject matter experts, in effect. Now, we've broadened the definition of that in recent years, both with the magazine, you know, seeing it as a platform for great outside writers and thinkers, uh, as well as just, you know, uh, for the staff and the journalism that they can produce. Uh, and then we've expanded it in going deep in some of these subjects like technology policy or healthcare policy. Um, so I think that, to me, is really the way to go, is to continue to expand and refine and grow sort of what our ambition is in terms of how we present and what we present to you uh, about Washington. Uh, uh, and I think there's also the possibility, of course, to export that to uh, some other places around the world, right? Uh, you know, and so that's the other part of our expansion uh, that I think is, is very exciting. And that's, you know, part of what I'll be looking at uh, in a more global way. We already mm -hmm. have Politico Europe, uh, and then we have some beachheads in various states around the country. How does that all start to fit together? Yeah, that's great. Um, we have one last question, and then we'll move into audience questions. Um, and actually, this is related to one of the questions from our audience, but um, you wrote a piece in 2014 called Editing White Female, or Wild Female, wow, <laughs> where you discuss women in journalism. Um, and to quote a passage, we like to pretend it's different now that Hillary Clinton really did shatter that glass ceiling into thousands of pieces, but it's not true. There are shockingly few women at the top anywhere in America, and it's a deficit that is especially pronounced in journalism. So in your article, um, you seem to frame it as an old versus new media debate. Um, and so since becoming editor, and this, you know, going with uh, this question from the audience, how have you or to create a new, better Politico for women? Um, and also, how has gender played a formative role in the development of your career as a whole and your involvement with Politico? Well, I mean, look, it's a great question. Um, you know, and, I, and by the way, that's the thing that I would say was the most surprising thing for me uh, when I look back to where I was in college. And if you said, well, fast forward, you know, 10 years or 20 years, uh, and the fact that it wasn't just some sort of steady march of uh, progress uh, would have been extremely surprising to me. And uh, I just read uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the FT, and they did a study of like all new CEO appointments in the United States, or in North America, all of North America mm -hmm. uh, last year. These were among the big companies. So there was something like, I want to say between 350 and 400 new CEOs of major companies appointed in North America last year. Guess how many were women? I don't want to. <laughs> one. 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 Uh, and, you know, that really tells you something. Uh, and uh, not only that, but there started to be some very interesting and powerful research uh, that suggests that even when women are given these big leadership positions, um, you know, that they're disproportionately bringing them in in times of disruption and change. Uh, they're coming in as outsiders uh, to the culture of places that are, you know, need change. That makes, of course, them much less likely to succeed in the job. Uh, and, you know, there's real, uh, that might be an intuition that many of us have, but what's been amazing to me in, like, looking at this over the last few years is that there's really um, numbers and data to back that up uh, in ways that suggest we're talking about a structural problem. And I, I imagine none of you could have watched the campaign as it's unfolded, uh, especially over the final month of the campaign, and not thought that it was an extremely gendered uh, discussion that we're having in many ways. And you know, whatever you think of Hillary Clinton's ideology or her politics, uh, you know, there's no question that uh, you know her gender has very much shaped her uh, public uh, trajectory and a lot of the things that are said about her. I think it was really summed up right in that Trump interjection uh, at the very end of the 30 day when he said, such a nasty woman. I was I was speaking with a group, um, uh, I gave a talk to a group of sort of working moms in Washington last week that was the night after that debate and it was very
very interesting, much more so than talking about uh, the uh, the tape or you know Trump's you know sort of assaulting women or whatever he's been doing. That was the comment that really I think stuck for them, uh, and that I you know resonates the most in maybe a, a professional context. And when I wrote that article, um, you know I have to say like it was the, the response was really striking. I got the biggest response from two different groups of people. One uh, was young people, uh, you know, especially young women just starting out their careers uh, and, you know, wondering, well, you know, how do I navigate things or, you know, I don't want to, you know, experience like all this big, bad world. And then the other group of people, uh, you know, really was very interesting was people my age or older, uh, and especially older. I got, I have people come up to me like at um, events or like, you know, they were random people I didn't know and they were like almost crying and they were like either like, oh, you know, these events, the things you're talking about, uh, you know, I, I've seen these horrible things happen to people or, you know, I, I, I would never be brave enough to write about that myself. And, you know, so that was, it was gratifying. It was awful. It didn't make me feel particularly good. And that's the final thing I would say on this issue of like sort of gender in the workplace. I've never been a big, I've always been, absolutely a very much a self-described feminist, but I never really wanted to be defined uh, as sort of like writing about women's issues or, uh, you know, saw a lot of that conversation, especially in an American political context, as being, you know, pretty toxic, you know, nobody wants to be like a charter member of the mommy wars, you know, that, that stuff can get very <laughs> uh, bad. And so, you know, you don't want to be, I never wanted to be defined by the fact of my gender, and I was interested in you know, talking about Russia and Vladimir Putin uh, uh, and, you know, the war in Afghanistan or um, national politics and uh, felt very lucky that I could do all of those things. Um, however, while I was doing all those things, I then realized, well, this march of progress that I was expecting to simultaneously also be in keeping slaves or where were all the other women like me? Where were all the other similarly situated women? And the answer is that they, they weren't there. Uh, and so that made me realize it is very important not only to speak up, because that's the other piece of it. Um, there's now increasing research also to suggest that this is not merely anecdotal. Just speaking up may not lead to a positive improvement, and that's true probably on issues of uh, racial discrimination and also about gender, uh, that actually they've now started to realize you need to have a much more sort of concrete and proactive, like, ask of people or, you know, specific things you want to try to change. And I feel like that's a super important thing. That, in fact, just talking about how unfair it is or how unequal things are or how bad it is may actually, oddly enough, uh, encourage people to persist in their biases. Uh, because it's almost saying, like, well, yeah, see, that's normal. You know, that's, that's how it is. So I've thought a lot about it. Uh, I, I don't have a panacea or one-stop solution. I think it is important uh, to be aware of it. It's not just, you know, you're going to wake up and come back to your 23 and then everything will be great. So. <laughs> so now we're going to move into questions from the audience. Um, yeah, you can out questions on your first and we'll just take turns reading them out now. So one of the first question is about Twitter. Uh, can you elaborate on what role you think Twitter has played in this election? Not just for the candidates, but more for your journalists. How they communicate, how they fight, argue, and fact check each other over this very public media. You know, this really has been, I think, the Twitter election. Obviously, Twitter is not like a brand new, uh, you know, platform by any means in um, this election, but it's clearly something extraordinary and absolutely like unlike anything else in American politics that. Um, uh, you have one candidate who's just sitting there, you know, watching TV and, you know, tweeting away what he thinks. And, and that has, on the one hand, given us pretty unfiltered access, uh, you know, to the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, Donald Trump. And that's something kind of amazing, especially in this day and age where we spent the last several decades adding layers and layers of handlers uh, around our politicians and, you know, being ever more careful in the way that they're presented. Uh, to the press as well as to the public. And so, you know, boom, you know, like all in like one fell swoop, you know, you sort of puncture all those layers, right? And you just have this guy, a man all over with his device, you know, <laughs> uh, speaking to us. 
So it's definitely will be studied, I think, forever um, from the point of view of um, that. As journalists, um, my husband will tell you, like, I'm way too addicted to Twitter, most, to reading it more than, you know, I'm not a big Twitter war, you know, queen <laughs> or kind of person. Uh, but, you know, it's an incredible source of, of real time uh, news and information, as well as insight into sort of the conversation and the ideas as it's unfolding. The problem is, is that it's absolutely, the scale of it is so large now that it's absolutely overwhelming. And, you know, you, I find that my head is about to explode at certain times, and I, you know, you need to make more consciously pull yourself out of that as well in order to, you know, really focus on something bigger or, you know, writing a longer piece or, you know, even just understanding the ideas that exist outside of that unfolding news cycle. The other thing I'd spotlight for you all is just, you know, because I think that's new too, is the explosive rise of sort of hate speech on Twitter uh, directed at journalists and just, you know, there's always been a certain, a fair, a large amount of incivility and, you know, sort of gross things, especially directed towards women uh, uh, in the last few years on Twitter. But the scale of it and the rise of this sort of anti-Semitism and the sort of empowerment or pseudo-empowerment of the alt-right, uh, you know, to sort of attack at all times uh, is something like both new and, and really disturbing. Um, you know, I've never seen commentary like that. We've always gotten letters, you know, to the editor that were even from crazy people and stuff. And that always occurred, but even so, I've never seen now all journalists, by the way, are presumed to be Jewish and are, you know, like attacking, <laughs> like unbelievable uh, anti-Semitic rants and terrible things. We've had multiple of our employees, uh, you know, people have been tweeting and posting on social media uh, with pictures of them and with bullet, you know, in their head or that just happened the other day where people in concentration camp uniforms with yellow stars on them. I mean, this is really bad stuff. Wow. Um, I mean, we have a question that kind of unfortunately perfectly dovetails. Um, so, again, increasing anger not only online, but also in person, right? So we see um, journalists getting kicked out of Trump rallies and um, an encouragement from, uh, from Trump at those rallies. So this person is asking, um, does this increasing anger towards journalists at rallies um, represent a danger to the press, um, press freedom? Um, is the U.S. moving towards press censorship or maybe some kind of auto-censorship in response to those attacks? Well, again, I mean, you have a very unique uh, uh, candidate in for Donald Trump who basically, uh, you know, is directly challenging sort of our our interpretation of the First Amendment and the role that the press plays in a free society. In fact, he just repeated that yesterday and doubled down on it. Again, his comments yesterday were, were very striking uh, in this regard. He really, um, uh, you know, believes, uh, does not believe uh, in the basic role of the uh, press as a part of, uh, you know, vetting candidates and, you know, aggressively and independently, you know, being a part of our political system. And, you know, he banned Politico and other newsletters news outlets like the Washington Post at various points uh, for months this year it was only at the insistence both of his running mate and his new third campaign manager uh, that we have been uh, allowed to attend uh, and given credentials to attend these rallies uh, so really just this fall basically but we've been allowed to attend these rallies right as they've taken an even darker and more threatening turn toward the press uh, and uh, you know as you know Trump is aggressively uh, promoting this idea that it's the rigged media uh, that is you know, somehow distorting the election and uh, you know basically seeking to sort of turn up the volume uh, of that anger of his supporters toward the press and it is a very menacing atmosphere that my reporters have described and you know that makes me very concerned um, you know blaming the media is not like a new thing and that's been you know a staple of campaign rhetoric as long as I can remember politics, uh, so it's important to have that context. But we've never had a candidate who really didn't accept the basic premise and role of uh, what, or he seems to not even understand what uh, the legal basis is on which uh, you, know, you need to prove things. He says he's going to sue everybody. You know, and he, never, he never issues his lawsuits because, in fact, uh, you know, I don't think he really understands what um, what the Supreme Court has decided and what you know is the legal freedom that we have actually to do our job.
touched on the rig media, and that aligns well with this next question. Um, so the New York Times today had an impressive spread telling up all of the different people that Trump has made disparaging comments about. And so, especially considering that the New York Times is a classic newspaper, do you think that was in bounds? Um, do you think that the New York Times needs to monitor each candidate equally, or does their work alienate part of their readership? Um, I love that. I, I, you know, I thought it was terrific. It was very clever. They've been run, keeping a running tally at various points, and so this was like the big two page spread, sort of capturing it all in one place. Uh, you'll notice a very long entry under Politico, uh, and, although their entry for themselves was even longer. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and, and some of it reflects, of course, Trump is obsessed with the media, right? So, you know, partially it's, it's a classic thing, right? He's uh, a creature in many ways of this media moment, and that's his sort of genius. Uh, well, love it or not, it, it is kind of his genius, his understanding how to position himself and, and playing it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't believe that equal time is at all uh, the responsibility of uh, the New York Times or Politico, I think uh, fair coverage is our responsibility and not the different thing. Uh, and uh, we, we don't give equal time you know, to, to lots of different things. It's just it's, it's, it's a concept, I think, that doesn't necessarily work. And in fact, were we to do so, uh, I think that would be very misleading in its own way. For example, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen sort of this implosion of the Trump campaign and as the uh, women have come forward and the team, uh, and then simultaneously you've seen uh, this release every day, this drip, drip, drip of uh, these hacked emails of Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman. Were we to give equal time or think of those in uh, the same way, I think it would be really a false equivalence. Now, we have aggressively covered uh, the Podesta emails, despite the claims of Trump and other people that we have not Politico in part. Why? Because that's our our mandate is to understand how Washington works. Well, listen, we you know we can't unknow this trove that's now out there uh, on the internet and uh, have real, relatively real time access and insight into understanding how a modern presidential campaign is run. Uh, you know, is is very uh, journalistically valuable. And there have been interesting stories in there. Some of them problematic for the campaign, but nowhere near the same level of. Uh, story or problem for the campaign as the kind of questions about Donald Trump's uh, character and behavior that have emerged, right? So I feel like we'd be uh, in a really bad place uh, if we were trying to say, well, okay, well, there's this, and then there's this, uh, you know, and then there's this. Yeah, um, I'm curious, because in political Europe, I know campaigns and the media work differently in a place like France, where you do need to have an equal amount of at least television coverage. Has that affected, like for, for all candidates, right, they like mandate that. Has that affected political Europe's work at all? You know, I mean, that's a very, that's a sort of uh, like a TV concept. And we have that, by the way, the Fairness Doctrine here in the United States as well with the FCC, uh, that again, the FCC also bans words like um, those spoken by Donald Trump from appearing on the air. Uh, and uh, you know, that used to be considered a good thing. Um, so, you know, it's not so much that. It is a very different system, of course. Politics in, in Europe are very different. And most of those countries are parliamentary systems, and they have much shorter campaigns. And, uh, you know, for better or for worse, we have more transparency in a way here. Uh, we got a lot more information about all these folks, and now we can even read their private emails. Uh, you know, but the flip side is uh, we have this incredible, grueling, elaborate, you know, multi years long. So this next question is about the book that you wrote a few years ago with your husband um, about Vladimir Putin's Russia and the end of the revolution. And so uh, were you to write another chapter now during this election, what would you say? How would you describe Putin's relationship with the presidential candidates and with America after November 8th? You know, I have to say, I never thought that uh, those two interests of mine, Vladimir Putin and <laughs> the American campaign, would intersect quite so dramatically. And that's been one of the big surprises, obviously, of 2016, is how much Putin has become a character in the campaign. And, uh, you know, Trump's incredible uh, refusal at every turn he was found, even, like, appearing to choose Putin over his own running mate, Mike Pence, uh, in the second debate. You know, this is it's really, I cannot overstate how 
extraordinary that is. Uh, and, uh, you know, because whatever you think of Putin, and by the way, you could certainly, there is a legitimate case to be argued that uh, while he's inflammatory and in your face, um, Russia has become much more of a regional rather than a global threat to the United States. You know, you, you could make uh, a case about how much, you know, we need to care about this uh, or whether we have the right policy approach. But to, you know, Trump's affinity with, with Putin seems to really be uh, almost as a sort of a, a wannabe authoritarian kind of fellow traveler uh, in a way that, that is kind of astonishing. Like, he seems to like the guy's style, uh, which, which is the part that, you know, seems pretty amazing for not only an American presidential candidate, but in 2012, uh, people, you know, couldn't believe it when Romney said that he believed that Russia and Putin were the greatest geopolitical threat still faced by the United States. And here you have the guy, his successor as the Republican Party's nominee, uh, taking the, the dramatically opposite point of view. Uh, so there's a lot to be written. I, I'm hoping um, after this election and when I'm you know, sort of having a chance to, to travel around more, there's a Russian presidential election. Uh, I think we know the outcome of that uh, on, uh, on March 11th. Uh, uh, and that will be 16 years you know, of Vladimir Basically, my husband and I first went to Russia together uh, in March of 2000 for uh, Putin's first presidential election, uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to get back there uh, before his next election. Yeah. Um, great. Well, one final question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we usually get we get this question usually at the end of every event, but. What is your advice for college students who don't know what they're doing after college? Um, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Well, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things, as I said, is like, you really, you can't project for 20 years, you know, and so um, don't bother. I always tell people, don't do a job because you think it's going to lead to something. Do it because you let want to do it. Uh, and do it because you are excited about it or you think it'll be good for you or you'll learn, learn a lot. Uh, and uh, I really, I think that, certainly I feel like that's served me well. And all of people have great, you know, opportunities and possibilities. And, um, you know, so that's a pretty good principle, I think. You know, don't do it because you think you should do it or because you think it, you know, five years from now it'll be something else. Um, great. And, you know, the main thing is, in the workplace, it is different than, you know, in the university or in academia. And, you know, there's so many amazing new things. It's a much more creative time, uh, even if it's a much more disrupted time uh, than when I was going to college. And I never would have expected that. I always thought my dad would have gotten a refund on his Harvard tuition. You know, I graduated in 1990 uh, from college. and I never, uh, you know, heard of email or the internet. I mean, I heard of the internet, you know, but certainly I, I didn't know what it was and it didn't have any connection <laughs> to my life. Uh, and so, you know, of course, a year later, we had email, we had the internet, and I felt like, you know, I kind of got jipped out of things. So, you know, take it for what you will, but the world is going to change an awful lot. Just to follow up, what about during college? What are the opportunities you would encourage students to? During college. You know, I'm sure every single person that's come here and said, like, whoa, college is wasted on the young. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to come back and, uh, you know, be able to, to do all the great things uh, that you guys have available here. You know, advice is, is really not worth all that much. I think, uh, you know, the, it's the, the part that I didn't realize uh, that I think people have become savvier about. But certainly, nobody tells you, like, as much about all these relationships that you're making now or all these people that you're getting to know now or even people that you don't really know very well. You're going to run into them in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. And that probably, to me, uh, is, the, is the big value of this. My husband went to Oberlin, and he's always saying, like, you know, it's really just not the same. You know, we are always meeting people that you went to college with. <laughs> Much more valuable than we understood it to be. Uh, 
when we were young. So I think you guys are lucky that there's just so many amazing people here. Uh, and I was going to die with us. Thank you so much.